Radio for Readers Bookmark. This is Bookmark. I'm Mark Furnier. The nation's top authors are coming up next. We begin today's program with John Dean, whose, pro, whose new book, The Nixon Defense, is really now more things that we never knew about. There are more tapes that have come out. You've gone through, I think, at least a thousand for this book. And I learned some things about the personalities, John, that I didn't know. Forty-two years after Watergate, people still ask you about it. And I, I said to my colleagues, the first question I'm going to ask John is, when are they just going to put all of the tapes out instead of letting them go in dribs and drabs? Well, most of the tapes are out. Uh, what I did and had realized had not been done. In fact, I probably not, would have not done this project if I'd have realized no one had done it. Uh, I pulled together all the Watergate conversations. And you can do that because the National Archives has gone through to prepare the tapes for public release and prepared a subject log, and they have a very abbreviated, they haven't transcribed the tapes, but they've at least got who's talking and the gist of what they're talking about. So they have, when I did it, it was they, they hadn't, uh, they didn't have them in digital form yet, but I went manually through these and found there were a thousand Watergate conversations. Uh, about 80 of them had been transcribed by the Watergate special prosecutor. Another 320 had partial transcripts by Stanley Cutler, the historian. But that left 400, I'm convinced, nobody outside the archives had ever even heard. Uh, and I ended up doing all the conversations because Cutler's were partial transcripts. The Watergate prosecutor only used about 12 in one of their trials, and those were, those were good transcripts. The rest uh, were done by FBI secretaries and weren't very good. They weren't even sure often who was talking. So I realized I had to do those again. And I got a team of grad students to help me, and it took us four years to go through it. It was a massive project, and I, I'm not sure what was harder, to transcribe them or turn around and digest them into narrative and dialogue. They were both tough assignments. There's an awful lot of material here. We learn more about the personalities of the people involved, Ehrlichman, Halderman, and even the president catching himself, not realizing or thinking, oh, maybe I was taped when I said that, and he had to walk back. That was what I was reading this morning. I had to walk back a couple of things because he knew he was being recorded. John, when did they actually start recording everything? They start recording in February of 71 uh, is where they begin. Uh, what's happened is there was a system where Nixon had somebody on the staff who typically was there. Haldeman would take notes when he was in the office, but those were just assignment notes. They were follow-up action uh, directives the president would give. But they would give you the gist of the conversation. But yet when somebody came in from outside, the instruction was with a staffer to make notes of particularly any decisions Nixon had made. This system broke down. That's why Haldeman in early 71 came into the president and said, listen, our record keeping is not in good shape. We're not getting good records of what's happening in here. And the Nixon, Nixon wanted that not only for historical reasons, but he didn't want anybody walking out of the office and saying he'd made a decision he hadn't made. Uh, so he had a staffer in there who was making contemporaneous notes. But that system, as I say, broke down. And that's when Haldeman uh, directed Alex Butterfield, with the president's consent, to, uh, to install the system. What I think was unusual about the system is it was voice activated. Uh, by voice activated, it meant not that anybody who walked in the room could be picked up, but only when the president was in the room because the Secret Service who maintained the system, what they did is they, they uh, uh, tied it in with a, what they called a locator. Uh, the president had a little uh, sound device in his pocket. He, when he got dressed in the morning, he put it in his pocket. That way the Secret Service knew where he was in the White House. If he was in the barbershop, they knew he was in the barbershop. They had uh, room sensors for, for all the rooms. So they tied the uh, taping system into his uh, activation device so that if the cleaning crew was in there at night, they wouldn't be picked up, for example, when they were talking. Uh, only if the president was in there would anybody be picked up. But Nixon forgets clearly at times 
that he's recording himself. There's <laughs> just no question about it. There are other times he very clearly remembers he's recording himself. The most infamous, of course, the, I believe, 16 minutes that is missing. Oh, well, the, the 18 and a half minute gap. I put, a, uh, I put an appendix in the book just on that subject. I put it in there because it's pretty much of a non-issue to me. It's very conspicuous when you look at the sequence, what was being discussed. Uh, and that's much more important to me than who discussed or who, who erased it. And what I do, though, for the reader is I narrow it down to the people who had access to the tape. Uh, and it's clear the motive. The, the whole issue comes up after I have had my March 21st famous cancer on the presidency conversation with Nixon, where he will claim that's the only time he ever heard anything about a cover-up, uh, which was baloney, of course, but uh, it's his final defense. And th what's clear is the tape that is erased, the 18 and a half minute gap, occurs on June 20th. Now, the whole defense of, of not knowing anything about Watergate is in the spring of 73. Uh, this conversation where it's erased, is his first day back, uh, his first conversation with Haldeman. Uh, and it's clear because all that week he's talking about cover-up things. That's the one they had power to subpoena. And obviously they said, oops, uh, we don't want that out. And so that's why that was erased. But what's interesting is there are much more damning conversations that week on the same subject. There are all kinds of things going on in this country at that time. We've got Vietnam, an uncertain economy. Does the Watergate cover-up, John, become a full-time job for President Nixon? Not initially, not at all. In fact, one of the real surprises, Mark, from the tape, uh, or the tapes, is that he, he initially instructs Haldeman he doesn't want to be told anything about it. He, it's kind of what they call willful ignorance, if you will. He, he really doesn't want to know. He, he says particularly tell Colson, who he's very worried about, his, uh, Chuck Colson being his special counsel uh, who handled some of the rougher assignments for the president. Uh, but anyway, he t tells Haldeman to not let Colson talk to him about all this. Uh, and Ehrlichman takes the same cue. So nobody tells him anything uh, the first few days. And it's very curious because Nixon is, uh, I don't put this sort of thing in the book, but it comes through uh, for the reader once the, uh, the reader works their way through these conversations that Nixon is not sure whether he has ordered this or not. Uh, he's not sure because he has or ordered an earlier break-in uh, at the Brookings Institute after the so-called Pentagon Papers leaked, uh, and he wanted to get in the vault of the, uh, uh, the Pentagon, excuse me, of the Brookings Institute to see if they could get out a copy of the Pentagon Papers. He's just not sure, and he's not sure if he's ordered Colson to do this. So uh, initially, there's very few conversations about it. Uh, so it's not consuming his time. Uh, it really doesn't consume his time until eight months later uh, when things are really, uh, we're, we're deeply in it and he's in bad shape. You know, one of the things I wondered during this time that leads up to President Ford ascending to the office, do you see Ford? Do, Does, I, do you come in contact with him? What's he like? Well, I knew Ford from my days on Capitol Hill. I had been the chief minority counsel of the House Judiciary Committee, and so I had had a working relationship with Ford when he was minority leader. Uh, but I, the whole Agnew problem doesn't even come up until long after I'm gone and everybody else is gone. Uh, that comes up in the uh, in the fall of '73 after. You remember Haldeman, Ehrlichman, uh, yours truly are all canned, if you will, because uh, he makes that very clear on the tapes that he's just making it sound pretty for Haldeman and Ehrlichman so they won't turn on him. But he's already, I, I've been very open that I'm going to talk to the prosecutors. I, uh, I'm beyond uh, redemption for him at that point. But anyway, uh, the Agnew matter, which results in Ford becoming vice president, uh, happens way after everybody's gone. So that's late in the game. Does Mr. Agnew know at the very beginning of Watergate, did he know anything? Or is he totally isolated? No, he actually knows. What happens is uh, on June 22nd or th maybe it was the 22nd or, or, or 23rd, I'd have to dig that out if I, no one's ever asked me this, but I, I, a unique situation is that Jeb Magruder, who is the number two man 
at the re-election committee, works for John Mitchell, and who has really been instrumental in having Watergate occur. He's the one who has got Liddy's plans approved after they were turned down twice uh, after Chuck Colson has called him and said, get off the dime or I'm going to use these guys myself. Uh, so uh, Jeb said, I was worried that uh, if I didn't get it approved, that Colson would do it and make a mess of it. <laughs> Not that he didn't make a pretty good mess of himself. But anyway, to, make the, to answer your question is after the arrest at the Watergate, uh, Magruder's playing tennis with Agnew. Magruder's a very good tennis player, and Agnew wanted somebody who was better than himself to bring his own game up. And so they're on the White House tennis court, and Agnew asks him, what, what is all this Jeb about the Watergate? And Jeb just tells him exactly what it was. And Agnew, who's very savvy, said, I never heard that, didn't want to know that. You told me more than I wanted to know, Jeb. We never had this conversation. So, yes, he knew everything from the get-go. All right. And the turnabout. <laughs> Does Mr. Nixon know about Agnew's problems? No. Uh, it's first hinted uh, uh, not until, as I say, Watergate is already a serious problem for him. Uh, and when he has started a deal with, with Henry Peterson, the head of the criminal division, who will actually make the decisions on the Agnew prosecution, uh, the first time that he's gotten wind of it is because Ziegler has come in with a press inquiry. They've picked up something from the grand jury in Baltimore. And uh, Ziegler thinks it's so over the top and out of the realms of possibilities that he comes in and tells the president about it and says, I've talked to Agnew's top guy, a guy by the name of uh, Marsh, and, and uh, told him to go kill it. I mean, this is just crazy. Uh, and, and Nixon knows nothing about it during this conversation. I listened to that conversation, and it's clear he doesn't have a clue what's going on. Uh, so this comes to him slowly and a terrible time, uh, although I'm, one, of the th one of the arguments that Nixon makes to his staff, and it's not too subtle, is uh, that if you want Agnew in here as president, uh, I'm ready to resign. Nobody wants Agnew in there as president. Henry Kissinger just uh, almost uh, 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 dissolves over the idea. Uh, he says, Mr. President, that's just a terrible idea. We can't have Spiro Agnew in here as president. And I'm wondering, when I remember watching this on television as well, unfolding the pressure that leads to the president to finally resolve, what it must have been like, not only for a cabinet person, but for you, sir. And I often <clears throat> wanted to ask you, if you could have lived your life differently, if you could have done something different that would have not dragged you into this mess, how soon would you have gotten out? Well, I actually tried to get out of the White House in September of 71, uh, which is long before Watergate. I went into Haldeman. I had just come back from a European vacation. While in the job I was in as White House counsel, you cannot negotiate for outside employment, but just without my ever soliciting it, two very attractive job offers had come. I'd paused in New York uh, to visit with some friends, uh, one who is a, was and is a very successful investment banker, wanted me to join his firm, and I, I, I said, that's interesting, I, that's something I could be interesting, interested in, but he said, I also would like to t have you talk to a a, a man who came to me for some financing uh, because his father is a uh, a client and he was a Greek Greek shipping magnate who was splitting off part of his company uh, for his son uh, and they wanted somebody as a general counsel who could go around the world and help them open ports, ports of entry. Both jobs depended on me having good access with the administration. Uh, I went and told Haldeman that uh, I had kind of a, uh, I'd made a commitment to Senator Barry Goldwater, a friend, personal friend, uh, that I would never stay in the government more than five years. Uh, he made me, pro he had nothing to do with me going in, but he just said, I want you to, I want to tell you, you just cannot stay in government. I'm, uh, I think it's a waste of your time and, and uh, you can come back in after you complete your career and, and, and wrap it up. Uh, 
Uh, so I said, I said, Senator, I'll do that. I'll promise you I do. And it was just about at the five-year time when I went in to see Haldeman and to tell him I was, had other authors, and I, I told him about them. And he said, you can't leave. He said, you owe it to us to stay. Through the election, I said, listen, my deputy, Fred Fielding, who will later become uh, both Reagan's count, White House counsel and uh, Bush II's White House counsel at the end of that administration. I, I said, Fred is quite competent to handle this job. He said, you can't leave. In fact, John, if you leave, you'll be persona non grata. In other words, he blew up the jobs. Uh, I'm sure he later wished he'd let me go. <laughs> Colson dies in 2012. Uh, I, I think that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, in the front of my book yeah. there, I have in the cast of characters, uh, the, uh, uh, it's right after the preface. I have all the list of all of the all the characters, and it's a little deeper in, right after the preface. Uh, you'll see in, right there you it's go. It's a big book, folks. There you go. Oh, my. And Pat Buchanan. Uh, that's another story. I mean, Pat Buchanan visited us in Daytona Beach at Embry-Riddle. I just did a show. I just did a show with Pat. Did you? We did uh, Colbert together. Oh, really? (laughs) Have you not seen that one? I have not. I will go back and look at it. You will. What was it like? I I had a wonderful time. I'm not sure Pat was quite sure who this character was he was dealing with because, you know, he. he, he, I don't think he watches Colbert a lot. And Colbert, of course, was having a wonderful time with Pat. (laughs) But I mean, the, the people that are in here. Jack Anderson, who now not with us anymore, a great writer. We had a chance to chat with Jack before he passed away. Senator Howard Baker, who is a truly a legend, a great American. He was one of the last ones to uh, to pass there before I completed the book. Yeah, the, the names are just incredible. It's anyway, such what's, rich Col- what, what's Colson's date of uh, death? What when I know he... it was 2012. Uh, it's yeah, 2012. Right. Did you get to see in the last few years any of these people? Very yeah, much? I did. It's Chuck and I. Uh, Chuck and I actually stayed in touch. I had a letter from Chuck. Uh, we didn't talk on the phone, but he would he would correspond with me. Uh, and the last thing he, the last message he had, it was actually to try to clean up history. Uh, I had testified that Jack Caulfield, who had been a New York City detective, who just recently died, also. Uh, and Caulfield was placed on my staff for budgetary purposes, although he was still working for Colson, I mean, for Ehrlichman. And Jack's job was he ran a private detective agency for the president and Ehrlichman, and I didn't know what to do with him. He wasn't getting any work out of me because I didn't have any need to, to do anything. I wasn't getting any assignments of, the, of this ilk. Anyway, uh, in July, after Ellsberg leaks the Pentagon Papers. Jack comes in wide-eyed. And you don't see New York City detectives wide-eyed about much. These guys have seen it all. He said, you've got to help me. I said, what's wrong? He said, uh, I just came from Colson's office. He ordered me to firebomb the Brookings Institute. I said, again? He said, he wants me to firebomb the Brookings Institute. And when the fire department responds, he wants to send a team of burglars into the vault because Colson says they have a set of the Pentagon Papers and they're not going to turn them over, so we're going to take them out. I said, Jack, do nothing. This is insane. Uh, It makes no sense at all. Uh, Little at the time did I know that this had been an order. Actually, three occasions, there are tapes of Nixon pounding on his desk demanding this. Uh, And it doesn't say firebomb, but break in there. I don't care how you get them, what have you. So... I, when I later testified, I test what happened. I fly out to San Clemente and kill it. I, I get a hold of Ehrlichman. Uh, Ehrlichman calls Colson and turns it off. Uh, says young counsel Dean here doesn't think the Brookings plan is very good. Shut it down. Uh, but Colson always denied to me. He said, John, I never did order a firebombing. I, yeah, I talked to Caulfield, but it got twisted somehow. Well, apparently, uh, shortly before. Colson died, he had a conversation with uh, Caulfield who said, yeah, I misrepresented that. Uh, And I figured out what's happened. Uh, Caulfield never straightened it out on his oral history with the Nixon library. uh, But I I think, you know, I I believe Chuck. I I take him at, there's no reason he would volunteer this to me other than the fact he was one of those lies he'd like to get cleaned up. 
And what happened clearly is Caulfield was working and in touch with uh, Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt, who were running this little plumber's operation, and they cooked this up. Uh, Liddy later writes about it in his book. He just got it at the wrong place yeah. in his book. Uh, but it's clear this is where it happened. Caulfield thinks it's insane. He comes to me, uh, and he lays it off to Colson uh, to get my attention that this, you know, he's got an order to do it. Uh, so I get it killed. But, I, I, you know, Jack, uh, in a sense, committed perjury before the Senate on that, too. Because it was it was not true, and I think Colson was being honest. I don't think Colson was that insane that he would firebomb the Brookings. Liddy, uh, that's another story. Well, I was going to ask you if you were going to give two adjectives to describe John Liddy, uh, G. Gordon Liddy, what would it be? <laughs> two, give me two adjectives, John. Uh, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. Gordon has, as you well know, has sort of portrayed himself that Richard Nixon hired James Bond to come into the White House and help him out. The fact of the matter is, uh, Gordon Lee isn't up quite to the Maxwell smart level of skills. <laughs> does that uh, answer your yeah, question? Yeah, it does. Sir. You've written so much about this over the years. This is the most complete of the writings since yes, you started. by far. This answers every question on Watergate. The one that they'll always ask is who came up with what did he know and when did he know it? Was that you? No, that's Howard Baker. In fact, you'll see in the, uh, uh, in the, in the front material, I take the, it was from a question that Howard Baker asked me uh, when I was testifying on June 28th of 1973 uh, before the Senate. And it's what, what people misunderstood it as a very clever probing situation. What Baker's actually trying to do uh, Baker would have one foot in each camp. He wanted to, w whichever way this fell, Baker was going to be at one to be on the winning side. So, but the, this is he's playing to the White House. And what he's trying to do is get me to commit perjury. He's trying to narrow it down, uh, get me to speak out of school, get me to over testify. But you see, I'm, I'm one who thinks I'm taped. I'm the one who tells the Senate that I think there's a tape of uh, at least one of my conversations. And they gave me a perfect opening to do that. And I, it's one of those things I added to my testimony after I'd done the first draft. I, I put a couple pages in at the very end because I knew it was my word against Nixon, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, and Colson, and who I didn't know who else. So if I thought if I say I think I'm taped on one or more of these conversations, uh, I'm obviously not going to lie. And, and Baker... Uh, would quiz, actually, but Baker brought out some of the best stuff as to when and why I thought I was taped. And it was, a, it was, it was because of Nixon's behavior very late on April 15th of 1973. I've been very open with him that I'm going to break rank. And I'm one who thinks that if Haldeman and Ehrlichman come forward honestly, that Nixon might actually survive. I'm not after, I'm not trying to go to war with the president. You know, this is, you don't, you know, I'm, I'm loyal. I, I'm, I'm believing his presidency can still do good and that he, I'm hopeful he can survive this, but I know he can't do it if everybody, if the cover-up continues. You're just not going to work. Anyway, uh, I was naive in thinking they would come forward because they, they thought I'd make a pretty good scapegoat. They just happened to pick the wrong guy. But anyway, on, on April 15th, when I'm talking to Nixon, uh, he does something that was very unlike our normal conversations. He asked me a bunch of leading questions. It was a late-night conversation. He called me back to the White House. I'd, he'd been out on the, uh, on the Potomac with Bibi Rebozo. Uh, it was clear from his breath he'd been drinking. He asked me if I wanted to drink. I didn't. Uh, he was not the usual crisp Nixon. He had on a smoking jacket where food had gotten onto the jacket. Uh, uh, but he had a yellow pad in front of him, and he takes me through these leading questions, and he's not getting the answers he wants. For example, at one point he says, you know, when you told me uh, on March 21st that these guys were demanding more and more money and you no know, telling how much they might ask and and uh, I ask you how much and you said well it could cost a million dollars over the next couple of years and I said well, I know where we can get that he said you knew I was joking didn't you when I responded I said well I didn't read it that way Mr. President I didn't react but if you say so questions like that he's not getting the answers he's trying to get clearly on the record to have me back off and and or, or confuse the issue but at one point he gets up 
uh, from his easy chair, goes over to the corner of the office, and in a stage whisper he says to me, he says, I was foolish to talk to Colson about clemency for Hunt, wasn't I? I said, yes, Mr. President, that was probably an obstruction of justice. Uh, at that moment, it clicks in my mind that he's recording this. He, I thought he doesn't want this on tape, uh, but he was interested in, in the information and my reaction to it. So I would later, because of uh, Baker pushing that and, and that testimony, his man on the staff, uh, when they were looking for anything that was wrong with my testimony, he's the one that will ask Alex Butterfield uh, later, you know, Dean made this statement that he thought he was recorded. Now, that's not possible, is it, Mr. Butterfield? And Butterfield would say, yeah, I think it's very possible uh, that uh, there's a recording of that conversation. And the rest, of course, is history. As I, as I say, in the, you know, my book goes right up, basically the core of the book, right up until they pull the plug on the taping system, which is the weekend, or right the day that Butterfield publicly testifies that there is this system uh, secretly recording all these key conversations. And uh, interesting also, I hadn't known Al Haig, who knew there were some tapes, uh, because he knew there were tapes of me that Nixon's very worried about. Uh, he, is, he is dumbfounded to learn it's a voice-activated system. He says, I just can't believe anybody would do that to themselves, you know, with all the expletives and all of the raw thinking and... and uh, and Nixon was pretty rough. Uh, he was, you know, at times a racist, at times a bigot, and uh, he was very anti-Semitic at times. And there it all is, you know. <laughs> so Haig, and Haig had heard it many times in his own conversations. So he pulled the plug immediately. We're, we're talking with John Dean. He is the author of the book, The Nixon Defense, an incredible story in this one-on-one -on, -one on Bookmark. Where did the hush money come from, John? Where did, how did they account for it? Well, there were, it came from, it was a major problem. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is on June 20th, the first day Nixon's back, the day the 18 and a half minute gap occurs, Nixon comes up with an idea. He knows there are going to be demands for money by the, the, uh, the men who've been arrested uh, and others involved. And he comes up and, and calls uh, Haldeman at home. The, the, uh, I pause because the, the tape of the conversation from the EOB, the Executive Office Billing Office, is generally pretty good. On that day, there's some kind of interference, and it's terrible. But the room conversation, I can pick up and hear what he is saying to Haldeman at least better than usual. That happens to be one of the, the, the more difficult rooms to hear the conversations in. But Haldeman happened to make some notes of the conversation. He's at home. And he's, uh, Nixon has just talked to Mitchell, uh, so I was interested to hear what that was. Uh, and he reports that, and I report it all in the book. But he also comes up with a, a plan to take care of these guys uh, that have been arrested and, and caught. He says they're going to need support. They're going to need uh, attorney's fees, which Haldeman will take as a cue. This is okay. But what Nixon has something that nobody else had thought about. He's going to take political advantage of this. He's going to do it in a way that is not illegal. In fact, there will be later conversations with Henry Peterson, <coughs> excuse me, of the criminal division, showing that this would not have been illegal if they'd done it this way. And that is, he's going to have an open committee. Uh, will raise money uh, down in the Cuban community uh, here in Florida. Uh, and they will uh, do it because that whole community was terrified of the idea of George McGovern becoming president. So he's going to make political hay out of it as well. And is quite confident he might well have been able to raise more money than we ever did raise. Uh, and if, had he done so, that wouldn't have been an obstruction of justice. It would have been a perfectly legal way to do it. What's ironic is Holloman tells nobody about this plan never shares it, although he writes later it was one of the cues to him that it was all right to pass out money. But he's not a lawyer, and he doesn't think this through. I don't think anybody, uh, I don't really figure out we're in on the wrong side of the law until we've spent a lot of money, and that's because Hunt starts saying uh, that, I, you know, this whole thing is going to fall apart, and these guys are going to start talking if they don't get money. In other words, it's a quid pro quo. That just changes the whole dimensions of it at that point. But anyway, you ask, where did the hush money come from? Uh, it, it, it was, first of all, leftover campaign money, some from the 68 campaign, some from the 72 campaign. Uh, and when that runs out, 
they go to funds which were also former uh, uh, campaign funds that had been turned over to the White House. Butterfield had kept them in a uh, uh, safety deposit box, $350,000. You'd multiply that by 5.5, which is the current value. That's a pretty good hunk of money. Anyway, so they go for that. But that starts to run out. I mean, a lot of money goes out. Uh, and Nixon, believe it or not, this is one of the revelations. On, there were, there's something new on every page of this book I didn't know. But anyway, Nixon goes out and helps Mitchell raise money by selling an ambassadorship for fifty thousand dollars, so uh, Nixon's deep in this, uh, and uh, they got like a whole finance division. <laughs> yes, indeed, there was. So it, the money came from lots of places. For you, what does this do for you? These writings over the years, is it a cleansing for you, John? Does it give you a chance to set the record straight? As well, time marches on? I, I got into this to try to figure out how anybody as intelligent as Nixon, as politically savvy, could let a bungle burglary blow up his presidency, just destroy it over it. I understand after, but I, fig- I, I learned I had to go day by day to see how he got involved as he did uh, and, and how it all unfolds. Uh, for me, it, 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 and the answer to that question, incidentally, is that Nixon is not as smart as we thought he was. He makes seat-of-the-pants decisions. He is, a, he is not a good administrative president. He does not make carefully considered decisions. Uh, he shoots from the hip all the time, uh, and they're wrong. And, he, and then he tries to use the power of his office to make them right. And they, they just buried himself deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, does not go for information that's right at his fingertips that he could get and would help him make intelligent decisions. So it, it, it's, it's, it's very clear that Nixon got in trouble because of his own uh, ineptitude. It, he's not a good criminal, uh, and he's not as clever as he thought he was, because in the past he'd always worked his way through these things thinking he was the smartest guy in the room. He never tells his lawyers what what are the problems. Uh, I'm, we learn later after the taping system uh, is pulled uh, that you know when he hires relative, he, he doesn't really hire real savvy counsel until he's resigned. Uh, that's when he, he gets Jack Miller and, and he's got a very experienced criminal lawyer. Uh, when he hires St. Clair, uh, James St. Clair, who was a, uh, recommended by Colson, uh, he's got somebody who knows state criminal law in Massachusetts, but not the federal criminal law. I asked the prosecutors uh, over the years, I said, do you ever see anybody in there that really knew what they were doing? And they said, not a person. Uh, there was nobody who knew what they were doing. They were catch as catch can. So uh, Nixon won't even confide in his lawyers. And of course, that's one of the reasons at the end he gets forced, he has to make the decision to leave because He's lied to his lawyers. He's misrepresented them. They, in turn, have gone up and made misrepresentations uh, to judges, to the Congress, and they're going to lose their licenses. Uh, There was clearly a cover-up of the cover-up is the second phase of it. Uh, Nobody's indicted or convicted for that because it got to the point where the problem... I've asked them, I said, why didn't you bring some of these guys who were clearly obstructing justice, go after them. They said, we just had to draw the line somewhere uh, and not look at, make it look like a vendetta. Uh, you know, the problem was solved largely when Nixon left and everybody was out of government. Uh, so there was no sense in being venal about it and going after people to just to punish them. While America knows who Gerald Ford is, and it goes all the way back to the Kennedy administration of before, people still wonder if he could have picked someone else or was Ford the safe bet? I think Ford, he knew Ford. Uh, I think he thought that there wouldn't be a rush to get Ford to become president. Uh, He turned out to be a pretty good president under the circumstances, Uh, made some tough decisions, including the pardon, which would cost him winning the election when he decided to go after the presidency. Uh, But uh, there were other people. Yeah, certainly there were other people he he could have tapped. But I think he felt... I need somebody who can get easily confirmed by Congress because we, they didn't want to, ha- you had a vacancy there and Carl Albert, who was a Democrat, who was terrified he might be president and actually not an uncapable person, Carl Albert. Uh, he had a drinking problem though. Uh, he was very kind of a small f- person f- uh, physically and 
uh, seemed to have a lot of complexes and spent a lot of time in lounges around Washington and didn't want to be president under any circumstances. But he was the next in line if anything happened to Nixon. And, you know, it would have looked like a coup because he was a Democrat, too. Yeah, can you imagine that? Just handing the, the power over to the other side in that fashion. Well, there was a lot of rumor going on that that was the plan, you know, but uh, that they would try to block somebody because the, when, when a president appoints under the, what, the 23rd, 25th. 25th Amendment, uh, uh, it, it is a, uh, uh, it, it requires both the House and Senate to vote on that confirmation of that vice president. Uh, and Nixon wanted somebody who could get through that process, and with Ford, he had somebody. I mean, the House clearly wouldn't vote against him because he was a member of the House, nor would the Senate likely vote against him. So, uh, and, and he had no, you know, say as a Rockefeller who had deep financial problems that had to be sorted through when he did get the vice presidential nod, uh, he, he, he didn't want that kind of time to elapse. He wanted somebody in there quickly. You know, I don't. Th I, I don't think it was a deal cracked in advance for a pardon. I wonder about you, with all that you were learning, even afterwards, after you're gone, just the the weight of this information. How did it affect you personally, physically? Was it difficult when you're carrying all this information when in your you, head? When you're young, those things don't have the same kind of weight that they do. You know, I. I was I was never personally worried about how I was going to make a living. Uh, I've been I, I was blessed with a good mind and and a quick study. Uh, I knew there were uh, plenty of other things I could do to make a a good a good living. I could go into business, uh, so I was never worried about myself in in that regard. Uh, and I've never been worried about the truth uh, coming out because I you know I I know what I did and you know I really wasn't party to a lot of this. It's it, the most difficult thing have been the conspiracy theorists who have cocked, uh, come up with these crazy schemes uh, to reinvent Watergate uh, that have been, in fact, that's probably one of the reasons I'm spending more time with it than I might otherwise, because I just got to put, I got to put out the truth. Otherwise, uh, they want to do what Nixon and the others were unable to do is make me the scapegoat. And I'm just not prepared to, uh, to let them get away with it. Based on everything you've written, everything you've heard, and your continuous legal education that you bring forth around the country, could this ever happen to us again? Not in the same way. Uh, you got to remember, first of all, post-Watergate, all presidents are, are, are no longer given the benefit of the doubt. The presidents are assumed to be doing something wrong until they prove themselves innocent, if you will. And this starts with Jimmy Carter, if you, if you will. Uh, not with Ford so much, but with, with, from Carter right down to Obama, presidents are not given a, a, uh, any benefit of any doubt of anything, whether it's, it's become more divisive and political lately, but even in, in the mainstream press, it, it is not uh, something that they do. They, they may be a little bit more reserved in going after him, but the, the burden has shifted. That's a huge change from pre-Watergate. You know, remember when Eisenhower, for example, well, you're too young, but Eisenhower came out and said, no, that U-2 plane shot down over Russia, that's not ours. Yeah. And has our, has our it said it's a weather plane. It has it painted green. So <laughs> <laughs> and it was a huge lie. And, yeah. of course, he's believed until they waltz out with France. Uh, Gary Powers, uh, and they, he actually survived it and parachuted into Russia, and, and they got him. And that kind of, uh, whoops, you know. If, if you allow me a sidebar, because this is such a rich story, but the opportunity to sit with you is, is such a gift, I want to ask you that you were also behind many years later. You began this process to see about impeaching President Bush. Is that not correct? No, I was never involved in impeaching Bush. What happened is where that started is I wrote a book called Worse Than Watergate, The Secret Presidency of George gotcha. Bush. And Did people want to take it and run with it? Oh, they did run. That was yeah. a huge bestseller uh, and, and actually still sells. I mean, uh, uh, the information in it is still valid. Uh, and, and the reason it is is because Cheney puts a system of secrecy back in the White House that is far more extreme than anything Richard Nixon did. 
uh, much more extreme. Uh, and I can't say that Obama has, has changed the system at all uh, and, and created much more transparency. The presidents kind of like what they're, to keep what their predecessors have done, uh, particularly when they're not going to take the heat for it, so he just keeps the system in place. Uh, you know, uh, I've often thought it, there are Bush people in the Justice Department that were bringing all these prosecutions under the 1970, excuse me, 1917 Espionage Act against newsmen uh, for leaking, a law that was never designed for that purpose, but there's been some gloss on it in decision-making that they've been now made it into kind of an official Secrets Act, which is really kind of... Uh, uh, a huge change in American law, and I'm sure Nixon is smiling someplace. But anyway, uh, the, 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 I was asked by Barbara Boxer when I was talking with her, I was asked to host a, uh, a, 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 a program where she had a novel, and sh they couldn't find anybody to interview her that she was happy with it. It's something called Writer's Block out in California. And with that, well, they've been always good to me. So I, they said, well, would you host it? And that's happened with a couple of people. I, Bob Woodward was another one I did and, and, and things like that. So in the course of that, she said something uh, about would, would I, do I believe Nixon, excuse me, do I believe Bush committed an impeachable offense? And I said, yes. I said, there's just no question he has. I said, he's violated treaties. Uh, that are the law of the land. Uh, we, we have promised the world we will not engage in torture. And we have engaged in torture. I don't care how you try to reword waterboarding. It is torture. And it was, uh, I don't think Richard Nixon in his darkest moment would, would have uh, authorized waterboarding uh, post 9-11. Uh, he he was served in the South Pacific where waterboarding started in World War II. And it was an awful procedure. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I started, suggested no proceeding at all, and because, you know, you got to remember, and Gerald Ford said it better than anybody else, the House can impeach a ham sandwich. Uh, it, there is no standard. It is whatever the House says is impeachable, is impeach, impeachable. I don't think that the Senate is so foolish that it, will in, it would indict and convict the ham sandwich, but uh, that's the way the, it's, a, it's a political process. Let me take one more step out and ask sure. you, based on your legal mind, what should we do legally with Edward Snowden? Well, I've always been, I, I've always had a very clear difference in my mind between Ellsberg and Snowden. Ellsberg, while people may not like, and, and I'm one who happens to believe you cannot run, no, go, no president can govern in a fishbowl. Secrecy is just essential. We have people trying to destroy this country, and they need, if they get inside information, they're going to use it against the president. Uh, if the president is reading his option paper on the front page of the news, New York Times, he's got problems. Uh, the, the secrets that Ellsberg uh, put out were, you know, that was sort of the pre-Snowden leak because of the volume of classified information that was put out. The difference is Ellsberg said he would, he would stand and take responsibility. He said, if I've committed a crime, you prosecute me. And he didn't try to run from it. Uh, his initial reaction was to go on the lam, but he was still trying to get papers out at that point. But when it later came, you know, are you going to take responsibility? Yes. Well, Snowden signed a, an agreement when he went in government, uh, that, he, that he understood there were criminal statutes that the just, Justice Department had, had uh, laid out very clearly that prohibited leaking, and that if he violated this written uh, letter and, and agreement of confidentiality, uh, that he would be prosecuted. So he went in knowing and the risk he was taking, and that was a risk he's unwilling to stand up and honor. And I, I see a difference between the two men in that. He had to come back and take his, take his chances in front of a jury and, and take his punishment. Do you worry that he's already turned over too many secrets to the Russians and the Chinese? Uh, I don't think he's turning it over to them. I think he's just making it public. So that's the roundabout way. To, I, don't think he's, I don't think he's committed treason, if I, that's, that's what you're saying, uh, to the contrary. You know, I, in my own situation, you know, I, I'm one who could have beaten the rap. Uh, I was immunized by the Congress before I testified. They could not have prosecuted me uh, on a month of Sundays. They knew that. Uh, and I created an enormous problem. Had I not been willing to, to 
plead, as I did, uh, to the only offense I know I committed, which was a one-count conspiracy, uh, when I became the linchpin of the conspiracy, they would have never been able to prosecute me. But as I told my lawyer, uh, my, I didn't start down this road to beat the rap. But he insisted that we play it his way, so at least I had that option. I, I often thought about Pat Nixon, too, you know, going through all of this. Did you know her very well, or you were just... Not, not well. Um, you know what's interesting? On the tapes, there's some really... Most of the personal information, or conversations with his wife, conversations with his daughter, have all been extracted. There are occasionally some who they have slipped and they've stayed into the collection, um, or they're talking sufficiently about government business that they couldn't justify uh, removing them. He has a, Nixon had a very nice relationship with his daughters, a loving father-daughter relationships. It's a shame more of these aren't out, so that, that side of him can be seen. Also, he has a far different than public perceived relationship with Pat Nixon. Uh, when, for example, in January of 73, and he thinks he's got a, a, a peace accord with Vietnam, he doesn't call Henry, he calls Pat and discusses it with her. It's a lovely conversation. Uh, and it's a shame more of that doesn't get out. He, he's a very complex figure because he's a different man with different people. With me, he's on a very high level. With Colson, boy, they're just down in the trenches and uh, playing around the sewers. Would you like this book, The Nixon Defense, to be used as a textbook in class? It, it's uh, because of its history. It, it, there's no question it will. It is being used as a textbook, along with my other book, Blind Ambition. Uh, it, it's a wonderful study. It's a little bit. Kids don't read books today in college. I, I've been, as a visiting scholar at USC and University of Southern California, for about a decade and a half. Uh, kids come in knowing nothing about Watergate, and the only reason I get packed houses is they're told to call their parents or their grandparents and see if they should attend my lecture. And their parents and grandparents say, you better get in there. <laughs> Good for you. So, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, if for any, in graduate school, I think it'd make a good book. Uh, undergraduate, not so good. It's too much, too much work for them. Do you have one more book in you on this? Oh, I've already started on my next book. I'm not announcing it, but I, I, uh, uh, I'm working right now on my next book. Hope you'll come back and visit with us again. Thank you, Mark. John Dean, The Nixon Defense. Our guest today on Bookmark. That's Bookmark for this week. If you have comments or thoughts on future authors, send an email to us at our website, bookmark.us. That's our broadcast for today. Thanks for watching.